I didn't quite know what I was in for. For someone that attacks your company, it's almost like attacking you. Ursula Burns made history in 2009 when she became the first African-American woman to run a Fortune 500 company. During her tenure at Xerox, she led the company through a transformational deal and faced intense pressure from one of America's best-known activist investors, Carl Icahn. Uh, you've said before that you, were, uh, you had sort of three strikes, if you like, against you for, in the terms of the overall business environment at the time, black, poor and a woman. Did it help that you were swimming against the tide? For me, it did. I think for other people it may not have, but for me it did. It's interesting, the three strikes thing, I didn't say, somebody said to me. Right. But I would have never classified my, you know, myself. I think the only strike there that is, that's really against you is um, poor. Yes. Being black and being a woman couldn't possibly be a strike. It's right. Kind of that's the, way, that's the way God made you. It's a little strange. Um, I think it was good for me uh, because I had a mother who actually really focused on the fact that where I was, the physical place that I was raised, et cetera, was not a definition of who I was going to end up being and who I was at that point, and how much of my future would be dependent on how much I tried and how much confidence I had, et cetera. Her appointment as chief executive at Xerox was also unique for being a transition between two women. How much pressure did you feel from the, perhaps from either of those factors rising to the top of the company you joined? Yeah, it's interesting. I think there were two things that were really um, heralded when I became CEO, when I was announced. One was that a woman had transitioned to another woman, which was the first time it ever happened, and, and still the only time, I think, that it's happened. And the second was a first African-American CEO. It turns out the, f the second, the first African-American CEO, was less focused on inside of our company. Because think about it, I had been there for, at that time for 30 years. Um, and for the last 15 or 20 years in my career, I was in very senior roles. And for the last 12 years, I had worked very closely with, with Anne. So I was prepared for the woman to woman thing. I didn't think a lot about the fact that I was gonna be the first African-American female. Did we, the media, make too much of that, do you think? They did, they did. But I think that, you know, now I've come to terms with it a little bit now more than I did before. Because there are more women and more underrepresented minorities that could run companies. There's no doubt about it. I'm not the only one. I happen to be the one found at the time, the one that society as a whole allowed to play the game. There are a lot more people ready to play the game, but you guys just don't allow it to happen as often. And one of the things that started happening at that time was a lot of discussion about how you know, spectacular and amazing I was. And I decided uh, just recently that the reason why those words were used is because it made it easier for you guys to accept me in. If I were just an ordinary person, then you'd have to start thinking about why I'm the only person sitting there. Within a few months of taking the helm at Xerox, Burns launched the purchase of Affiliated Computer Services, or ACS, for $6.4 billion to provide growth and offset decline in the traditional document business. In hindsight, does it still seem that it was the right decision? Absolutely. I don't think that we could have made the journey. I know Xerox could not have made the journey. With, and I know ACS couldn't have made the journey without us being together. And I think in the intermediate to long term, even in the short term, but in the intermediate to long term for sure, I think you'll sh it shows that we could actually create value. It was a really tough way to do it. You know, it was a really, uh, really kind of crazy way to do it. Uh, but it, I think it was the fastest way that we could have transformed ourselves. So I want to cast your mind back to autumn 2015. So you announced a comprehensive review of Xerox's business and within weeks, activist Carl Icahn yeah. announced that he had a 7.1% stake in the group. What, what does it feel like as a CEO waking up to find one of the world's most notorious, I know he wouldn't use this term any longer, corporate raiders on your doorstep? Well, definitely not uh, the best day. It's interesting how I didn't quite know what I was in for, if you know what I mean. So it wasn't this really big, oh my God, uh, kind of a thing. It was, it was more of a creeping knowledge and awareness of 
just how much energy this is going to take. Do you remember where you were at the moment of? Yeah, I do. I was in. It? I was. Um, I usually walk. Uh, I get up in the morning and walk a run or go to a trainer. And I was walking around the Central Park Loop, and my head of investor relations called me, and she said she um, we had stock watch people. Uh, we, we knew someone was in, and it was Carl. And then for the next couple of days, it was, it's a blur. I, I couldn't tell you exactly what happened or when, but I do know that um, th when the blur kind because, you know, you have to call your board, you have to get a whole bunch of advice about what to do. And early on, I had to kind of get really trained on how to be a little bit less of Ursula Burns and how to be a little bit more guarded in what you say because did it feel personal or did it feel because it did. Your sense it does. he was he was attacking uh, or at least threatening the integrity of the company you'd always worked for yeah. and that you headed the the deal that you had done uh, he was essentially saying let's dismantle this, this dismantle or it, consider yeah. dismantling and and it is it did in the beginning and i had some great advice you know it turns out without this advice it would have i think everything would have turned out very differently, simple advice. And someone told me, uh, don't take this personally. I worked at Xerox uh, by the time I retired, but for 38 years. And for someone, not only him, but anybody leading up to this time, that, that attacks your, the company, it's almost like attacking you. So yes, I took it personally, and, but you can't do that. Because from his perspective, he's not taking it personally at all. It didn't matter whether it could have been me or Joe Schmo sitting in my chair. He had a mission that he was on and he was gonna actually execute that to the best of his ability. And my, my responsibility was to, because at this time we had already, I had made it relatively clear with my, to my family and to myself that it was gonna be time to retire. It had nothing to do with with um, the actual deal. So that part was good in a, in a way. It was almost like playing with your last, with your last cards in your hand. Mm -hmm. So it made it easier to kind of feel a little bit dispassionate after I was reminded that that's what I had to be. We had a better relationship than I thought would have been possible at all. He knew kind of where I stood and I knew where he stood. And we then laid out his course and then my course. My course was the company's course, his course was Icon Group's course. So it was, it was definitely tough, but it was one of the most intense learning experiences that I ever had. Burns says when Icon bought his stake, she was already examining the breakup of the group into a services business, ultimately listed separately as Conduent, and a hardware company. We started that process before Carl came on board. It was really interesting. I was doing a TV interview, and the interviewer said, Carl, Icon, they, they, made, they made a... Well, they insinuated that Icon had, had forced your hand. Yeah. And, I, and, and I said, you know, it's just not so. And it's a better story for you guys if it is so, but it, it's just not so. First of all, he couldn't have operated that fast. I mean, it, we couldn't have operated that fast. And the way that it came out, I got more calls about how like perfectly pitched that was. And you must have practiced it a lot. And I said, not at all. <laughs> like, not at all. I didn't practice it one bit. In January 2017, just over a year after Carl Icahn took his stake, Burns stepped down as chief executive of Xerox. She stayed on as chair until May last year and went on to join the boards of several companies. Last time we met in 2011 to talk about the ACS integration, you, you said to me, this may not work and so next time you see me, I may be out of work. So do you feel like you <laughs> failed? I don't even remember that. Um, not at all, not at all. I think we could have done things differently and there are things that we could have done better. We could have made certain calls quicker, but I'm, I'm naturally, I wake up after hitting a home run and say I could have done it better. Obviously, you're not out of work. In fact, far from it. You're, you're, you're chair of Vion, the telecoms operator, whose offices we're in today. Uh, you sit on the boards of several companies, including Nestle, ExxonMobil, American Express, and Uber. I mean, what lessons from Xerox have you brought to those rules? I mean, perhaps specifically Nestle, which is also now facing activist pressure. Are you the yeah. person on the board who can say, you know what, I've been there, and know how to deal with these things? I think what I found out at Xerox, particularly during the end of my career, is that leadership matters. It makes a difference. You have to actually take a stand and 
not spend a whole bunch of your time looking back. If all you did was kind of babysit something, it would almost surely fail. You gotta have to, particularly in a tech industry, right. particularly in industry today where everything is affected by tech, you absolutely have to continue to move. So I think that both Carl Icahn and Xerox are all the well for, um, for the engagement that we had and that I definitely am. I'm definitely, um, the timing was good and I'm definitely okay. More than okay, I'm actually pretty good.